Welcome, I'm Brad Richter, coming to you again from the Guitar Salon International Studio for another We Are Guitar. Since last time I saw you, I've been enjoying getting to know the work of today's guest, Mia Garcia, whose exploration of bossa nova, Afro-Cuban jazz, hip-hop, and R&B have led her to develop a singularly beautiful playing, writing, and producing voice. She's both a rising star and a student at USC here in Los Angeles. We'll have a conversation with Mia and a performance by Mia and an outstanding student from a lead guitar program run collaboratively with the Aspen Music Festival and School will join us as well. As is tradition, you can join Mia and lead guitar students around the U.S. in a virtual guitar ensemble at the end of the show. We'll share music and some playing tips later on. Let's start things off, though, with a performance that includes some dear friends of Lead Guitar and Guitar Salon International Foundation. The group is led by Bill Kanengeiser and includes some of the most accomplished young players in the world. Here's the USC Guitar Orchestra playing Hadrian's Wall by Sergio Assad. I play guitar at Maryville High School and my favorite sound on the guitar is using the guitar as a drum. 
my favorite sound on the guitar would be an E chord. And my favorite sound is the G chord. My favorite sound on the guitar is the sound of rapid strumming. My favorite sound on the guitar, it's chords, like a G. My favorite sound on the guitar is harmonics. Those are some great sounds. Let me show you one of my favorite sounds. You might recognize this from the show opener. Which, I just love the guitar's ability to make these extracurricular sounds. Percussion, harmonics, tapping, there's so many things the guitar can do to be expressive. So speaking of being expressive on the guitar, before we meet Mia Garcia, let's check out this performance of her song, Miyazaki. Close your eyes and see a Miyazaki picture show. How can you let go of the things that are bound to unfold? Tell me you despise all the things come by constantly. Carpentry cut from the tree of the soul in me. Shut your eyes, rest your mind and your soul on. Close your eyes and see a Miyazaki picture show. How can you let go of the things that are about to unfold? Mia, thanks so much for being with us on We Are Guitar. Thank you for having me. Well, you're sure welcome. And I've really been enjoying getting to know your work a little bit over the last several months. And one of the things I notice is that your playing and your writing has this natural sophistication to it, like you've been doing this for decades. And I, I wonder, I know you started playing guitar when you are 10 years old, but before you were 10 or at other times in your childhood, were, were you showing signs of being a creator and and uh, uh, yeah, just what were the first signs that you were destined to do what you're doing? <laughs> um, thank you so much. That's really kind. Um, yeah, I had always uh, sang when I was little and my family would always like play me songs and then I would kind of like sing back all the words without really like even really knowing English that, that well. I would just be like singing the words to the song. Um, and then also my grandma sang to me all the time. So we would like sing together. Um, so I think just kind of like, it was a really natural process to come into being a creative person, um, just since I already loved it so much since I was really little. And then, yeah, as I just grew older, I kind of like learning to write, I would always just start writing stories. Like when I was in like first and second grade, I have all these little journals of like, practicing my handwriting, but I'm writing about these like weird stories that I just, <laughs> I don't even know where they come from. Um, so yeah, I think there were just a lot of things, um, like little telltale signs that I was definitely going to be 
a creative person um, throughout my life, but grateful to have had those opportunities. Do you come from a family of musicians? You said singing with your grandmother? Yeah, um, not, I mean, kind of. It's like my parents uh, aren't musicians. They love music and they have really great music taste. Um, But my dad's mom, my grandma on that side, um, she was an amazing singer, had like the craziest, just like strong voice and was like very like 50s classics, kind of like Frank Sinatra and like just all sorts of like big voices like that she was inspired by them so she sang a lot um and then my two older brothers had a ska reggae band when i was growing up so i'd always play with them too oh that's nice uh, nice to have that variety of influences filtering through you as a songwriter too yeah definitely a lot of different facets coming through and like inspiring the process so uh, speaking of the process and, and being a filter um, what's your approach to songwriting? How do you how do you start and, and what's the process like? Um, it's kind of different every time. I feel like there's just like a few key ways that I like to rotate between. Um, but usually I'll start with either just words, like a poem or a story. Um, or I'll start with just like a composition on like piano or guitar um, with like voice leading and like just different melodies happening and intertwining. Um, from there, I'll kind of just like see if I want it to be like a full written song with words or if I just want it to be an instrumental composition. Um, but yeah, just kind of like seeing whoever I'm inspired by at the time. Like right now, I'm super inspired by like Moses Sumney and Napalm um, in terms of their like lyrics. lyrics. Uh, so yeah, I take a lot of inspiration from like different writers that I like or just like different life experiences. Um, and emotions. So it's kind of a little mix of everything. And I noticed from watching some of your teaching videos that you've got a really um, deep knowledge of music theory. What, when do, how does that come into play or, or does it at all? Um, I feel like theory kind of helps me analyze the things that I do naturally a lot of the times. Um, I like to use it afterwards to understand kind of like oh i really like this type of resolution or like this chord progression whatever it is um but i feel like usually when i'm starting something that's just coming from like myself or just coming through me um it's just kind of happening and there's not much thought involved it's like whatever the natural process is going on i think that's really important I, I, i'm a composer myself but but um when carlos rafael rivera was on the show last time he said the same thing and i think we all kind of feel that way that we want to have music theory we, we want to understand what we're doing and what's happening but for, for me i like to use it to solve problems if i'm stuck and i don't have a better idea that's where music theory comes in definitely yeah um, well, um, what advice would you give to a young guitarist who uh, uh, wants to start creating in some way? What's a, what's a good way to start? For a young guitarist, I would probably say definitely just be keen on using your ears all the time because I think a lot of the times when you're starting to learn an instrument, um, it can be challenging just getting like the mechanics under your fingers. Um, but once you kind of like develop those skills, you can start to develop your ear as well. And that is the biggest thing that will lead you throughout the rest of your creative exploration. Special, but you made me feel like I was 
this part of the world that felt so real and I will change my tone and I will buy new clothes for you for you for you Yes, that's so pretty. I love your voice you and the so words much. are so pretty. You can really feel the emotion. Oh, thank you so much. Ah. <laughs> I'm so overwhelmed because I was watching a lot of your stuff when I was hearing about you. So, oh. Oh, my God, I love here. Oh, my God. I'm so honored. Oh, <laughs> I'm like fangirling right now. <laughs> Well, I want to get out of the way so that the two of you can talk, but I just have to say to Maya, I am just so moved by that song. I get teared up every time I hear it. This is like the seventh, eighth, maybe tenth time I've heard it. Um, and uh, drives me crazy that you say I'm nothing special in that song. You are so special. Uh, such a talented person. Thank you. Anyway, so uh, uh, Maya, I know you've got questions for Mia, so go for it and I'll get out of the way. Okay. Um, so Mia, I was wondering, I was looking through some of your videos and I noticed a little theme of Studio Ghibli and one of your song names was Miyazaki and the other one was Mononoke. So I was wondering if you had any inspiration behind by Studio Ghibli from Hayao Miyazaki. Yes, I'm a huge fan of Miyazaki's work. Um, yeah, I just love his animation and just like the worlds that he's able to create are so special and beautiful and they always really inspire me to like write and the music is also so beautiful in those films. Um, so yeah, I'm a huge fan. I'm delving or I've been delving into songwriting now um, and I'm going to be going into songwriting for college career. I was wondering if what type of song is hardest for you to write? Is it just like only guitar or guitar and singing? So which one do you say is the hardest for you to write? I feel like, um, I don't know. I think it goes both ways. It just depends kind of like what my ear is leaning towards more the day. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes, yeah, sometimes I can write either one in like 10 minutes. And then sometimes it'll take like, you know, weeks or like a month until I finish a song or even longer, you know, like I'll just keep working yeah. on it. What does this mean? Should I work on exactly. it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's so nice that you're going to college for songwriting though. That's going to be so fun. It'll be fun. I'm excited. I'll go, I'm going in as music producer as well. Whoa, uh, cool. Do you yeah. like this too? I do. I love producing. I've been exper experimenting on this little application called Soundtrap mm -hmm. and we just make our little beats and everything and it's really exciting <laughs> that's so cool yes i love to hear it i love producing too i use ableton mainly um but i always use like garage band and stuff in school and just like yeah. what was around it's the easiest the easiest one <laughs> so fun though. that's awesome maya those are great questions thank you for 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 bringing that into the conversation thank you i'm so thrilled to have both of you on the show and uh maya i can't wait to see what you do over the next few years but but uh, we'll all we'll all follow what you do and and mia wow it's so fun to catch you at the beginning of what looks to be a stellar career coming up so um, uh, really have enjoyed getting to know your work um, and can't wait to see what you do with the next 20 years. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here with you guys. And it's so fun meeting you guys both via 
connection here. So <laughs> it's been <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for having me. We're honored to have you. Yes, Maya, I'm so excited to hear more of your music. Keep making beats. I'm so excited for you. I will. I look forward to your EP. I'm so excited when I heard you said you were going to release your EP. I will be hearing that and telling Ooh. everyone about it. <laughs> oh, thank you. You too, whenever you release. You. I will. I will let everyone know. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll sign off there. Thanks so much, and I'll see you both really soon. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Students, if you'd like to audition to be a featured soloist on We Are Guitar, let your teacher or lead guitar instructor know you're interested and they can help you prepare a video. We only feature one or two soloists each show, so just a few students who audition end up on We Are Guitar, but those who put in the work to learn a piece and submit a video are welcomed into what we're calling the Circle of Soloists. Members of the circle get free private lessons with a lead guitar teaching artist. Their videos and profiles are celebrated on social media, and they have an open invitation to play a solo at their local showcase concert, held on partner campuses like the University of Arizona, the University of Denver, the University of Georgia, and Roosevelt University in Chicago. So here's a quick look at some new members of the circle. It's time now to welcome Dennis Azabagic for our mini master class. Make sure you grab your guitar so you can join in. Dennis, welcome. It's so good to have you back again. Thank you so much, Brad. I'm happy to be here one more time with you, with our guest artist and with all lead guitar students. So what are we doing today? Today I'm thinking that we could discuss a little bit our sound production, tone production, right? Um, sound is a medium with which our instruments or we communicate when we play it. So why not spending a little time and, and try to make the most beautiful sound that we can uh, produce? So the first thing that we have to always pay attention as we very often reiterate in our curriculum uh, with all our students is a proper right hand position. So tracing our bridge, to the point where this line meets the lower bout of guitar, placing our forearm right there, thumb comes on the sixth string, creating a little bit of an angle in the wrist so that we have enough space between our wrist and the guitar, about three fingers worth of it there, and then with our other digits, with our index, middle and uh, ring finger, we can play our strings, making sure that when we sort of like a nudge the string in a very gentle way, not putting too much pressure, not hooking up the string, not pulling it upwards, but just pressing down with our uh, rest stroke, pushing down into the string, following through and gently releasing that pressure until we hear a very beautiful tone. In lead guitar, we often start students with no fingernails at the very beginning and then we transition to having them use fingernails, say, around the time they get to book two. For us, that means when they start to use free strokes and combinations. But what are some things that students can do to be a little more aware of the, f the sound their fingernail can make on a string, even accidentally when they're not using their fingernails to play? And then what do we need to do to take care of fingernails later when we really begin to use them with, with focus and consciousness? Not using the nails in the beginning, it's a very important because that's an additional uh, uh, element that we need to ca take care of. So in the beginning, without nails, it's easier to set our hand in this proper position. So once that settles in, uh, in a very relaxed mode of playing, so to speak, then introduction of nails as an additional element does not present uh, too much of uh, trouble. Um, what you've said, when we play without the nails, right? You still can have uh, nails that are too long and they're not taken care of and they are a little bit ruggedy or they have a little uh, chips in them or, or little cracks, you know, and they are not smooth. So 
when we try to play with that kind of nails, for example, I can demonstrate with my pinky, which doesn't have a really that, that great of a nail since I don't use it in my playing, but if I try to play with the nail that it's not really adequate, first of all, what I get is this sort of click that when the string slips into that space between the fingertip and the nail, and then just the nails gets over the string producing a little bit of a harsh sound. But if I do that with my other nails, with my other fingers, which I have taken care of, and I will speak of that in, in a moment, um, then the nails are shaped in the way that they are really smooth. So when the string crosses over the nails, fingertip and the nail at the same time, the sound is really pleasant, very sort of like um, rounded rather than harsh, right? So what can you do if you are not playing with your nails for the time being, then trim them down so that your fingertips are clear from any obstacle when they are crossing the string. Once you start growing the nails to implement them in your guitar playing, then you really have to be careful of taking care of those uh, of, of the nails in the same way that you're taking care of your instrument, which means uh, take a filer, take a sandpaper, uh, usually we use a sandpaper that's of, of a very high grid, right? 1200 or 2000 or even more, that are very, very, when you are uh, filing the nails, it will give it a very smooth edge so that when you are playing, your tone is going to be very gentle and very, very, very smooth, so to speak. Nails, 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 when you, when you get to be a more experienced player, huh? In other words, what do you prefer more, Brad, here? Let me show you. That's number one. Number two would be as follows. Right? All right, very good. Well, Dennis, thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll catch you again soon. Absolutely, and next time in person, I hope. Yes, next time in person, finally. All right, have a good one, Dennis. Take care. I would say my biggest challenge would be reading the notes and switching chords. And what I'm doing to work on this is that I am reading notes at home, and I'm watching YouTube videos, and I'm also working on my, my finger pattern. Something that I learned in guitar class is notes, rhythms, the finger position, how you hold the guitar. After practicing strumming with two fingers, I've gotten really better at just playing the songs. I was able to improve those challenges through my teachers. They were able to point out the things that I miss or things that I need to work on. At the same time, them looking out for me makes me become more motivated in practicing and staying on top of things. Those are some really good points. Music reading, alternating between your I and M fingers as you play, changing chords. These are all things that are difficult for students at the beginning, but you can apply the same approach to each of those issues, something I like to call component practicing. If you're struggling with note reading, for instance, put down the guitar and practice saying, or even better, singing note names as you read. For alternating between I and M, practicing right hand alone by walking on the B string helps etch that finger switching into your tactile memory. And isolating your left hand to practice chord changes allows you to be more conscious of the subtle changes you have to make with your wrist and hand while changing chords, like the pivot you make moving from C to G that requires motion from your hand, from your wrist, and from your forearm. Quite a bit to do there. Anyway, we can apply that approach as we get ready for our virtual ensemble with Mia Garcia. We're performing an arrangement of Green Sleeves by Jonathan Chrisman. It's in the key of A minor, and there are four chords we need to know. There's the A minor, G major, C major, and E major. We're in 3-4 time, and the chords change slowly, mostly every two measures, so that's pretty easy. We usually scroll the simplest ensemble part along with the chords on the play along video, but here we're scrolling the melody, which is a bit more difficult to read on the fly. So I'll isolate two components that I think need extra attention. First, the rhythm. Green Sleeves is made up of three measure long rhythmic motifs. There's a dotted half note, three beats that take up an entire measure. One, two, three. 
a dotted quarter note followed by an eighth note and a quarter note. One, two, and three. And a half note followed by a quarter note. One, two, three, one. Every measure is one of those three rhythm sequences. If you're not confident with them, take a little time to clap and count without the guitar or play them with the right hand alone on an open string. The G sharp, F sharp exchange that happens in measure 15 and 31 can be challenging for the left hand. Let's take a look at that. You can practice that by isolating your left hand and focusing on the placement of your first finger for the G sharp and your fourth finger for the F sharp. And as you go back and forth between those two notes, focus on landing on the very tip of your finger and placing that fingertip right behind the fret like I'm doing now and also keeping your fingers curved and relaxed as you play. And once that's happening consistently, you can add your right hand back in to be sure you're getting the tone that you want, no buzzes, for instance. But as I'm doing this, it occurs to me that it's also a very good example of why we want to play always with our left hand thumb behind the neck. If I were to hook my thumb over the top of the neck like that, it really takes that fourth finger out of position and it's difficult to make that stretch. It's not impossible, but a lot more awkward. So watch out for that and think about that technique, left hand thumb behind the neck at all times. Okay, we're ready. If you'd like to take a look at one of the other ensemble parts or print the music, you can go to leadguitar.org where you'll find scores and practice videos by clicking the We Are Guitar navigation under events. All right, let's play. It's so enjoyable to see those things come together. Thank you to all the students who submitted videos and the teachers and parents who helped them. You know, we started these broadcasts as a way to give students opportunities to perform and stay connected through school shutdowns. It feels momentous to be coming to the end of the school year knowing that if as many as possible of us get vaccinated, we're going to have a pretty normal next school year. I'm very proud of all of you who managed to keep learning, playing, and teaching guitar in spite of the tremendous obstacles. You've shown a lot of grit. Have a great summer. I'll leave it to Isis from Muchen College Prep in Chicago for our parting thought. I just feel like music is just here to bring people together, make you ease at mind, and make you understand life better through different points of view.